Good morning and welcome to this session of the Orkney International Science Festival online. In this session, we'll be going to look back more than 5,000 years into the past, into the time when the stone circles and chambered cairns were being built in Orkney and across Scotland. One of the big questions is why the people of the past went to such an effort to build large structures in stone. And another of these questions is how did they think and could we call them scientists or even mathematicians? Our very own Howie Firth looks at these questions in two ways. One is as a mathematician with a degree in mathematical physics from the University of Edinburgh and research in particle physics at Durham University. The other approach is from his deep interest in the history and philosophy of science, a subject in which he has given many talks in many places. It's important to stress that this lecture is dedicated to one of the great names in Neolithic archaeology, Dr. Ewan Mackay. It is the third of the memorial lectures dedicated to three great figures in Northern archaeology, who all sadly die with it, died within the past 12 months and are all deeply missed. They were all fellows of the Society of the Antiquaries of Scotland. And one of the society's vice presidents, Barry Ferguson, is here with us today to say a few words about this special occasion. Um, thanks very much, Matt Jass. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank the festival for allowing the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland to be involved in this fantastic event. My colleague Heather James participated in two lectures on Sunday and had a marvellous time, so we really must do this more often. Uh, I'm really excited to hear um, what Howie's going to say about the incredible work that Ewan undertook in trying to help us understand more about why our ancestors created their incredible monuments in the Neolithic period. Hope you don't mind if I say a short word about the society. We were founded in 1780 to provide an independent forum for the study, conservation and, enjoy and enjoyment of Scotland's past. We have over 2,700 fellows worldwide from a diverse range of backgrounds. Antiquities that past fellows originally collected and left to the society were transferred to the care of the state in the mid 19th century and now form the basis of the internationally important collections of the National Museums of Scotland. The only qualification you need to join is enthusiasm for Scottish history and archaeology, so please consider doing so. Today's lecture is, of course, in honour of Ewan. Can I take the opportunity to flag that a legacy fund has been established with the Society by Ewan's family in his memory to provide for scientific analyses or reconstruction images relating to the Neolithic or Iron Age Scotland? If anyone would like to donate to the fund or would like more details, you can find those on the Society's website. Thanks, Matthias. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction, Barry. Um, and of course, after Howie's talk, there'll be time for questions, uh, which you can kind of send in from now uh, in the YouTube's live chat. But for now, um, it's, over, it's all over to you, Howie. Well, thank you very much, Matthias, and thank you very much, Barry. And this talk is about the history and philosophy of science and what it can learn from the remarkable insights developed by archeology span and social anthropology. And it's a great honor to speak in memory of Ewan Mackay. Over the years, Ewan gave insightful science festival talks to appreciative audiences. I first met him in 1977 when he visited Orkney with an outreach talk. His book, Science and Society in Prehistoric Britain, had just been published, opening up new vistas on the Neolithic. He showed how to look deeper into the structure of the stone circles and better understand their builders. As years went by, I saw he also had a great human quality. He sought the truth and would defend it with courage and character, whatever the cost. Now, we sometimes think of science beginning with Newton, but the story starts much further back. The great historian of science, George Sarton, divided progress into half centuries. From 450 BC was the age of Plato, then the ages of Aristotle, Euclid, and Archimedes. 
later ages were named for people in China, India, Persia, Turkey, Afghanistan, and the Arab world. The first Western names start in 1100. But in fact, the great 20th century archeologist, Professor Gordon Child, the man rem remembered in Orkney for his work on Scarabray, said that the most remarkable scientific achievements of all were in the Neolithic. That, he said, was the time of a radical change in our relationship with the natural world. Before then, we hunted animals and gathered plants and shaped our lives around what nature provided. In the Neolithic, humans became active partners with nature. We herded the animals and cultivated the plants. That was a colossal step to take in a world subject to the forces of nature, to drought or flood. Herding animals or storing grain may have short-term benefit, but to take on ourselves some of the powers of nature was to cross a line. Gordon Child called it the Neolithic Revolution, with so many different areas of knowledge opening, farming, pottery, baking, spinning, building in stone. Each achievement, he said, involved an amazing transformation of raw material into something new and unexpected. By heating friable and plastic clay, crumbling, crumbling clay, clay you can mold, by heating it, the farmer's wife can induce a chemical change, driving out the water of constitution from the hydrated aluminium silicate, that's the main principal component of clay. She drives the water out to produce pottery, and that's a substance with quite different sensible qualities, no longer plastic, no longer disintegrated by water. By the rotary motion of spinning, she can convert certain natural fibres, wool and flax, later also cotton and silk, into threads by a still mysterious rearrangement of the molecules. The, the challenges in these developments are so immense, it's difficult to see how they managed it. For instance, these people of the Neolithic developed all our own main cereals of today. They developed them out of wild grasses, but those grasses often looked so different. So when a botanist suggested that maize comes from a wild Mexican grass called teosinte, this was hard to believe as the overall plant architecture is so different. And you can see it there on the left, wild teosinte, how bushy it is, Maize grows tall stalks, and then on the right, the seeds, teosinte seeds, have a hard covering, very unlike that soft, juicy covering we know in maize today. Botanists have identified one possible route. Some of teosinte's features come from regions of the same gene. Side branches are in one section of the gene and seeds in another. So if you crossbreed teosinte plants, and keep selecting for fewer and shorter side branches, then you also find more and larger seeds. But they say to fix that gene could have taken from 300 to 1000 years of breeding. And through that work over all those centuries, those Neolithic plant breeders gave us one of the three main cereal crops that we rely to feed us today. But how did selection start? Here, here's just one suggestion. It comes from researchers at the University of Michoacan in Mexico. They noticed a story from the Huichol people. A hungry man met the mother of maize who gave him tortillas and the choice of one of her five daughters, each with a color. He chose the girl of blue maize, described as the most beautiful and sacred one. Blue is a strange color for maize. One of the chemists thought of copper sulfate with its rich blue color, and they thought there's copper chemistry in the soil, there's copper storage vessels. Could copper have had an effect on something to do with maize? So they applied copper sulfate solution to teosinte seeds, and they found some plants developed with shorter branches and richer seeds. Now, that's just one illustration of potential research, and it illustrates the list that was made here by Professor Gordon Child. These are the exact phrases he used. He spoke of the biochemistry 
of bread making, the chemistry of pot making, the physics of spinning, the mechanics of the loom, and the botany of flax and cotton. The great social anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss also highlighted the scale of Neolithic accomplishment. This is what he said. There's no doubt that all these achievements required a genuinely scientific attitude, sustained and watchful interest, and a desire for knowledge for its own sake. For only a small proportion of observations and experiment could have yielded practical and immediately useful results. Neolithic or early historical man was therefore the heir of a long scientific tradition. And indeed, Levi Strauss takes it further. He says there are two great peaks of science. One is our modern one from the 17th century, and the only other one going right back into the past is the Neolithic. And between the two, he says, there's a level plane stretching out. The big question, Levi Strauss says, is why the extraordinary achievements of the Neolithic did not continue. To resolve this, he argues, we must think of two different types of science. He doesn't say much more. It's quite tantalizing at that point. But there is a clue now in the work of another great modern thinker, the Romanian historian of religion, Mircea Eliada. He looked at the story of an American Indian who refused to till the soil or cut corn, calling it a sin to wound the body or cut the hair of our common mother, the earth. And Eliada immediately sees the significance. These words, he says, were spoken not much more than half a century ago. That's the words about refusing to till the soil because it's a sin to wound the body or cut the hair of our common mother, the earth. These words were spoken not more, more than half a century ago, but they come to us from very distant ages. Now, this takes us to the heart of the ancient worldview. The pattern can be found around the world, tracked back into the past through traditional beliefs and stories. No, back one, back one to the, that's it to Eliad, we'll stay with Eliad, because th those, those words will very much in inspire us for what follows. We go back into the past, traditional beliefs and stories, and all the evidence from the Neolithic added up to so much else from so so ancient societies that continue hunter-gathering and, and fishing and today, they saw the work as fundamentally alive. Now, that is the big difference between them and us. Our worldview is to start with matter as dead, inanimate building blocks, which we move around to create the world. We start with matter and we put the whole question of life to one side. Not everyone thinks like this. Alfred North Whitehead was a highly disciplined philosopher who collaborated with Bertrand Russell on the monumental work of building up mathematics from logic. It was very dry, very demanding, very precise work. And you, you couldn't imagine someone being in a more detached and unemotional and objective worldview as, as Whitehead working with Russell. But Whitehead went on to make a powerful case for life being built in as part of the fabric of the universe. In other words, he said, the universe is alive. More recently, the Nobel physics laureate, Professor Brian Josephson, has observed that physics starts with matter and tries to build up life. And he wonders if it might have tried doing it the other way around. However, that's still very much a minority view. But overall, here is the big conceptual divide between the Neolithic and us. Our science is built from reducing the world to pieces, and trying to reassemble them. Neolithic science started with the world as a whole living unit. Interestingly, there are areas of modern physics that speak similar sounding language. For example, if you break up a hologram, you don't lose the pattern. Each piece, however small, will retain it just in poorer and poorer resolution as the pieces get smaller and smaller. We, we now need an important idea from an Australian thinker, Dr. Melanie Perschel. She says that the mathematics that cultures develop can be linked to their worldview. 
Now, in our worldview, a dead earth, that can be walked on and measured with a ruler or cord. A dead earth made of pieces like building blocks that we assemble. So our mathematics will be a language of space. In other words, geometry. Very much in accordance with our physics, geometry cuts the world up into little pieces by drawing lines and the, and the results, the pieces are displayed statically in front of us. But to study a world that is alive, we would therefore need a different kind of mathematics. So what kind would we need? Well, if we think about it, life is about movement and change and life develops in time. So to study a world that's alive, we need a mathematics of time. How could we find that? It turns out that this question was actually asked nearly two centuries ago by one of the greatest mathematicians. And here he is now on the, the next slide. It's Sir William Rowan Hamilton. In June 1835, he read to the Royal Irish Academy an essay on algebra as the science of pure time. Hamilton showed how from the notion of time, you can build up the structure of algebra. Now we can get a feeling for this on this next slide, just one back there. That's it, that's the one. In algebra, we do operations like addition and multiplication, and there are sequence in time. You can see that first equation at the top. It's a sequence, you multiply two and X, you also multiply three and y, then you add them up. It's a step, step by step in time, quite the opposite of geometry, where we have pictures laid out in space. Algebra is about actions. And this is what Hamilton wrote some weeks afterwards. The moment is to algebra with me, what the point is to geometry. Transitions, intervals from one moment are analogous to finite straight lines, a number is the ratio of one such transition to another. Now we can see why number comes into this because number is closely linked to time and change. Here's number and you see the very simplest possible, if you're describing changes in the world, you can describe spring coming and the migrant birds and the leaves blooming and the flowers. Well, that's very complex. What's the simplest possible change? The simplest possible change is with those numbers, adding one. One, two, three, simplest unit and the, the simplest change. You could say that adding one is the equivalent for time that an atom is in space. But now you might say, well, we've known all about numbers since primary school. We, we learn to add one and one and make two. Why all this talk about a mathematics of time? Why was it so important for Hamilton? as to read a paper to the Royal Irish Academy about it. Well, the numbers are our starting point. In physics, we bring particles together and create structure. We can do the same with numbers in mathematics. And let's take these simple numbers that we learned in primary school and do something simple with them, add two numbers to get a third and keep on doing it. And you can see now how to do it, very simple. Zero and one we'll start with, we get one, add two to it, we get three, three and five, eight, eight, and so on. And we can carry on on the next slide. I think we've got a, a picture of what we get, that's it. One and one started with zero, one and one, two, three, five, eight. This is good practice at this type of morning, mental arithmetic with 34 and 55 will take us up to 89 and so on. Now you might say, so what? This is very, very simple things with simple numbers. Well, this is actually where some magic comes in. Let's take a break and go out to the garden and look at the flowers. And in fact, I did that some days ago and just count their petals. Well, an iris and a lily, each have three. You don't actually often find four petal flowers, but we can see here five petal ones. Now a buttercup and a wild rose. That's a marsh marigold in the garden, still going well. And as you can see, it's got five petals, double check, both of them have five. And then the next slide, I think it's a periwinkle, or definitely a five. We could even look at the, there it is. I think this is a forget-me-not, and one, two, 
three, four, five, quite a lot of fives. So few fours, quite a lot of fives. We've got a three, we've got a five. Others stand out. Clematis has eight. The Clematis here didn't do very well, so we couldn't photograph it. But here's one now. Both corn marigold and ragwort have 13. This is a sort of ragwort that's fading a bit, but it's still a rather nice one, but it's got 13. Some daisies have 13, some have more. Turns out that black-eyed Susan and chicory have 21, plantains 34, Michaelmas daisies 55 or 89. Now, those numbers look familiar. If you were mentally doing that counting earlier on, those numbers look familiar. And before going back to them, I should say, other numbers are found in petals. So don't blame me if when you count very arduously a petal and you get to a number that isn't, is short of say 34 or just above it. But it's just, there are far, far more with these particular numbers than you would expect by chance. And you can find these numbers elsewhere and seeds on a sunflower head, for example, are arranged in spirals. And you can see this one, there are, two families of spirals. One curls clockwise and the other curves anti-clockwise. And the number of spirals in each case is again one of these special numbers. Now I need to give them a name. They're called the Fibonacci sequence after the mathematician who highlighted them in the 13th century. And here's the numbers now. You can see them or oh, just mention the flowers there. Three, five, eight, 13, 21, and so on. And you can, it's really fascinating. And of course, what you mustn't do is pull the petals off when you, you count them. That, that is definitely not, not to be encouraged, but it's really worth counting. Well, the man's name, Leonardo of Pisa, it was he who first promoted the modern number system instead of the old Roman one. The numbers appear in other places in nature. You find them in the number of scales on pineapples and you find them on tree cones. You can actually graph them as well. And there you are graphing them. Now you see how you do it. You started off, you start off with a one, you start off with boxes. There's a box of five by five. So remember that three, there's a three by three, a five by five, eight by eight. You build up 13 by 13, 21 by 21, and you get the shape of a seashell, and there are actual seashells in nature with that precise shape. Now, this is really remarkable. In the space of minutes, we've gone from sitting indoors with pen and paper, playing with numbers, doing some very simple primary school calculations. We've then made predictions about the number of petals on a flower or the shape of a seashell, and we've been able to go out and found that nature is following the pattern. Well, that's encouragement for the route that we followed to seek the mathematics for a universe seen as alive. Remember how we said it? We said, let's, a universe that's alive needs a mathematics of time. A mathematics of time, according to Hamilton, is a mathematics of algebra. Algebra, actions in a sequence, lead us to numbers which build up in a sequence. We adapt sequence, we play a little bit with the sequence, we get the Fibonacci sequence, and back out we go, and we discover that in the natural world, structures are out there that connect with what we've been looking at as a mathematics of time. But of course, the big question is, did the people of the Neolithic do the same? In particular, did they know about Fibonacci numbers? Well, over the years, some people have said actually said they found some Fibonacci numbers, some proportions of buildings some on some layout of, of sites that seem to be in a Fibonacci pattern. But when they've done it, their work doesn't seem to have been followed up, probably because there wasn't at the time any reason to look closer. There's a substantial body of work by the late Anne Macaulay. Now, interestingly, she wasn't a trained mathematician, but she was much respected by mathematicians who corresponded with her. They admired her clarity of thought, her discipline, and they were interested in her conclusions. 
Her conclusions are quite remarkable. She said that over a third of the sites she studied, over a third, included an underlining structure. The underlining, underlying structure was a pentagram characterized by a pair of Fibonacci numbers. Now, we'll just look briefly at three images of the sites. That's an analysis she did at the Milton of Clava. And I'm making the, should make the point here that I haven't gone into her work in any way, done any kind of analysis or structure. But I think it would be fascinating for somebody out there with the, the, the appropriate skills to go in and look at it. It would, who knows what, it, what, might, what might be there. And it just needs investigation. You can see the next one she's got there. Here's another one. And it's at Inverness. So I don't know if anyone listening is in the Inverness area and has experience of surveying and a, a mathematical interest. And this next one, I think it's Kubrishire. But she is looking and she says she sees a, a Fibonacci structure. So this is a whole area of research to go through work like this in detail. And it's a question then for archeologists and question for mathematicians who would like to help them. But now thinking about it, the discussion about stone circles and mathematics has been primarily in, up to now in geometry. For instance, in various stone circles, right angle triangles appear. And this is very much the, the language of right angled triangles. They, they follow Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras' theorem, the sum of the squares on the two shortest sides is the square of the longer one. So with a triangle like this, you can get three numbers, the shorter side and the longer one. Right angled triangles were highlighted by both Professor Alexander Tom, who carried out many years of precise surveying of the stone circles, and by Ewan Mackay himself, who collaborated with Professor Tom and considered his studies. And they also collaborated with another outstanding man, the late Professor Archie Roy, the astronomer. In particular, they noticed a certain type of triangles and these, these characterized by these numbers. They notice triangles characterized by three, four, five. The sides were in proportion to three, four, and five, the two short sides, three and four, the longer side, five. They also noticed triangles five, 12, 13. And interestingly, just a month ago, an Australian mathematician identified three different ones on a clay tablet from Babylon dating to around 1700 BC, found the two that were found at the Neolithic sites, and also this one, 8, 15, 17. And there are various places that these Pythagorean triangles, or you could call them Pythagorean triples, form. So there's a kind of structural relationship between the numbers 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, and 8, 15, 17. Now, if you look at some of those numbers, you may remember we've actually come across them today. There's a number 5 appearing there, a 13. And here is a most remarkable thing. Every second Fibonacci number turns out to be the longest side of a Pythagorean triangle with whole numbers. So down at the bottom, you see the Fibonacci sequence, and I've put in red every second Fibonacci number, 5, 13, 34, 89. Well, it doesn't matter how long you continue that Fibonacci series, you will always find, with every second Fibonacci number, you will always find that you can put it together by taking two other whole numbers, squaring them and adding them up. This is a most fascinating thing to do, actually. I've never tried it, but I've been thinking it could be highly relaxing. Continue that series. Well, say the next one is, um, it'll be 144 after that. So you'll have to add 89 to 144. And that number, how interesting to try and make it up out of, um, out of the, this Pythagorean process. Now, there are quite a lot of other relationships between Pythagorean 
triangles and Fibonacci numbers. So when we find Pythagorean triangles with sides in proportion three, four, five, what we have to think about is what is or what was the most important aspect to the people who created that triangle. We, because we think very geometrically, have been looking at visually what appears, the triangle itself, and then we've been noting in passing that the sides are in proportion three, four, five. It might actually be that to the people who created the structure, it's the three, four, five relationship that is most important, and that the right angle triangle is just a way of expressing it. And just as an aside here, I would like to say that the question of the relationship between number theory and geometry is actually so fascinating that it continues today and it's right at the forefront of research in mathematics. Some mathematicians are suggesting the relationship between geometry and number theory is so deep, we might be able to build up all of geometry out of number theory as something deeper and more fundamental. The American mathematician Robert Langlands won the Abel Prize in 2018. For his work in this field, he developed what's known as the Langlands program. Just this year, two mathematicians, one in Paris, one in Bonn, have done something remarkable. They've created a new curve whose points are linked to patterns in prime numbers. So with that curve is geometrical, the points are linked to something in number theory, and they forged a link between the two. And with that link, they can derive familiar geometrical structures, like Pythagoras theorem, from deeper patterns in number theory. Well, thinking of Pythagoras, no writings of his have survived, but we know what he taught because his followers told us in particular that Pythagoras said that everything is created out of numbers. Modern science creates everything out of atoms and fundamental particles. Pythagoras's worldview was to create out of pure numbers. He also said that each number has an individual character. We can see that here. Three means the heavens, four means the earth. We, we speak of the four corners of the earth today. And we can combine these numbers in various ways. We can add them. Three and four make seven, which happens to be the number of the the known, the visible planets in Pythagoras time. It's also the number of stars in the Great Bear. Multiply them and we get 12, the, the houses of the Zodiac. And we can combine them in a Pythagorean triangle, three squared, four squared, five squared. And five in the world of Pythagoras represents humans because of the, the five digits, the, the extremities, fingers or toes. It also represents light and it also represents balance. Now, before you think that I am going off on a tangent into number mysticism, I should say that not only is there an underlying structure to this, but there's a great deal more about these ideas in an Encyclopedia Britannica article on them by a very able mathematician of today, Professor Ian Stewart. So the it's a, and it will having a picture of a, a different way of thinking, but there is structure and reason in that different way of thinking. Well, if it's the case then, that what was important with the three, four triangle was not the geometrical shape of the triangle, but these numbers three, four, five. And as you can see that with the Pythagorean images of numbers, three, uh, you've got the heavens, the earth, humans or balance, if, why would you want to build that into the stone circle? Well, it must be then that somehow the three, the four, and the five are bringing together heaven and earth. Now, chemists could look at that and say, well, this is, you, you, you add things together in a chemical e equation, you add hydrogen and oxygen to, to get water. In this case, you're adding in a Pythagorean way, the heavens and the earth to give human life as somehow as associated with them. The, we're made of water and clay from the earth infused with a, a spirit from the heavens. And if five represents light, you can also think of light as something that travels between the sky above and the earth below. And five represents a balance. 
Now, strangely, and thinking about this combining earth and sky and the message, if you will call it the message in the stone circles, combining earth and sky, it's almost like a marriage or a wedding. And indeed the medieval alchemists carried on an old tradition of the marriage of earth and sky. Well, would stone circles have anything to do with that? Let's look at this next quote. Because stone circles, actually a number of stone circles have been associated with marriage. This is the antiquarian William Stukeley on Stanton Drew, the circle there, and he says the people call it the weddings. And there's a story. It's a company that assisted at a nuptial, a nuptial solemnity, thus petrified. Other circles are said to be the company dancing, and a separate parcel of stones is called the fiddlers or the band of music. And indeed, right across the, uh, Britain, there are these old stories of stone circles, and they're linked with wedding, weddings and dancing, and sometimes whether it's the end of the year or whether it's midnight, they're turned into stone. So interesting that tr tradition associates them with weddings, but the mathematics, the Pythagorean mathematics of bringing three and four together to make five is very much about this bond. Now, why would you want to bind earth and sky together by mathematics? Well, it might be if you felt that the earth-sky relationship was liable to disruption. It might be that you would want to do something to help to preserve stability. It's interesting that tree ring records do pinpoint several periods of minimal growth of five to six years in succession, and hence climate disruption over the past five to 6,000 years. So again, this is a suggestion for researchers to investigate. Do the tree ring dates for climate disruption correlate in any way with periods of stone circle building? Just one more thing. We're suggesting that the mathematicians of the Neolithic built a universe out of algebra and numbers as a mathematics of time rather than geometry as a mathematics of space. And we're suggesting that this split could explain the two different types of science that Levi-Strauss speaks about and our contrast with the modern scientific worldview with that of the Neolithic. But physics today has integrated time into space through the approach of relativity with a four-dimensional space-time. But now, however, the physicist Fotini Markopoulou says that the century-old problem of trying to reconcile quantum theory with relativity means that one of them has to give ground. Something's got to be done either to quantum theory or relativity. She proposes tackle relativity and make time fundamental with space generated out of it. She proposes building the world out of highly abstract fundamental evidence, which she called graphs, and her theory is quantum graffiti. Now, this leads to a strange situation in the, and I'll summarizing. Here is the Neolithic worldview on the left and the modern worldview. In the Neolithic, life's fundamental. In the modern world, it's matter. The Neolithic, the whole infuses the parts, the parts build the whole. In the Neolithic, it's process and flux. The modern world is solid things. In the Neolithic, it's forms. In the modern world, it's substance. Time is primary and remains distinct from space in the Neolithic, but in the modern world, it's space, which is primary. And through relativity, time is brought in into the structure, which is set by space. A mathematics of time and a mathematics of space are the contrasts. And number theory is fundamental in the Neolithic, Whereas number theory is marginal and it's possible to go through courses in, in mathematics at all kinds of level and avoid number theory. And number theory in just about all mathematics departments is very much on a, a little corner on its own. Whereas other branches of mathematics like statistics and calculus and, and so on are much more useful in the modern world and are therefore much more integrated into the, the main body of mathematics. 
So I'd summarize it this way, seeking the mathematics of the Neolithic and moving away from the Western worldview gives a new perspective in assessing fresh ideas that are urgently needed in modern physics to resolve deep philosophical issues. By looking at the Neolithic, we can shift our worldview. It's very difficult if you're brought up in a worldview, very difficult to get away from it and look at it from the outside. But if we shift to try to understand the Neolithic worldview, we can then better get a fresh perspective on our own one. And this is the message that comes from studying the science and the mathematics of the people of the Neolithic. By being open to the ideas of the past and trying to understand them in their own terms, we open up new possibilities for research today. Research right across the board in not just one discipline, but a number. In Ewan Mackay's final book, written against pressure of time with the knowledge of his own failing health, he put all his remaining strength into making the case for respecting the intellectual skills of the thinkers of the Neolithic and the painstaking work that has been done to analyze their stone structures. He didn't want us to instantly believe, just asked us to take time to investigate systematically and carefully, as he himself did so well. And as he explained in the closing words of the book, to do so with an open mind. The scientific method that has guided me during my professional life is one of hypotheses derived from both deduction and induction. When a radical concept emerges that provides a fresh and unique perspective on the Neolithic mind, like the work of Professor Tom, we should welcome such episodes as opportunities to test, develop and modify the existing model. It is surely only by constructively engaging with new and challenging hypotheses through the careful and considered empirical testing of the available evidence that our collective understanding of this fascinating period of our prehistory will be further elucidated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howie, uh, for, as usual, a very wide ranging and extremely insightful uh, talk. Um, and I'm, as we have Barry here, I'm delighted to actually ask Barry to start off the questions. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much. Howie, that was incredible, uh, really thought provoking uh, chat. And as I admitted to you before the session, um, I'm no mathematician, um, but if you'd taught me, I might, you know, might have reconsidered that. Re amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, which um, just trying to formulate in my mind and, and um, coming at it as a non-scientist and a non-mathematician and thinking about stone circles in particular and the work of um, Alexander Tom and, and, and Ewan and, and you mentioned um, Archie Roy as well and any sort of reading I've done on their uh, work on, on stone circles is very much about phases of the moon and uh, looking at the relationship with, you know, where the sun rose at certain times of the year uh, and so on. And, and why the ancient um, people, why the Neolithic people might have, have been needing that in terms of, and you, you referred to, you know, the, the growing of crops and, and everything else, but just wondering to what extent you feel that the, the, the creation of the stone circles and the relation to heavenly bodies for want of a better term accidentally resulted in some of the mathematical phenomena that, that you're talking about came about or do you think they were sufficiently sophisticated to have come up with what we now know as um you know the geomet geometric or algebraic patterns um you know how how sophisticated do you think you were? Did it did he do you think they came about as an accident? That's interesting. Well, first of all, astronomically, the people of that time have to be very good astronomers, simply because in the Neolithic there's much evidence for people traveling very considerable distances by sea. I mean, e even out um in out in the Atlantic to the Canary Islands, for example, and, and even today the sailing to the Canary Islands can be quite an un unpleasant experience with, with the weather. So they have to be very, very good 
astronomers. And it's interesting with the stone circles about the alignment, then the question is why is it so important to do this with stone, because if you want to obviously follow the, the movement of the sun and the stars by the season, you can do it by the horizon or, or sticks and so on. So it looks as if in the stone circles, it was felt to be very, very important to bring the earth and the, the sky, to link the earth, the movements of the sky and the earth. And all along I had assumed that it was as above so below, as the alchemists would say, that the pattern of the sky was being brought down to the earth. But if now thinking that they were concerned about a balance, it might be that the stone circle is being built down here on the stable earth to kind of help to hold that kind of harmony and balance with the sky itself. As to their ability in mathematics, I think it can never be underrated. I was thinking as an example, what um, a conductor of an orchestra does. Some conductors incredibly can memorize the entire script of a symphony and conduct an, an audience. You can see sometimes a pianist, a concert pianist do that. The entire um, piece again of a, of a piano concerto playing. The, there are so many examples of these remarkable powers of people and, ju well, just because they don't have pen and paper, I know, in, I guess, in theory, they could write it in sand, but just because they don't have pen and paper, I don't think means they can't. And, and indeed, in more recent years, the example of Stephen Hawking was incredible. I can't imagine how I could ever do any mathematical calculation without being able to hold a, a pen or a paper, and yet he could. So I think... We, we know that people push technology to the limit, and I think they can push intellectual and mental abilities as well. Thank you so much, Howie. Uh, we have a lot of interesting discussion on YouTube. Unfortunately, with the, you know, because it's already quarter past 12, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get through even a fraction of all the questions. A lot of discussion along similar lines. Was it structured research and development in the Neolithic time? Or was it something more akin to sort of experimentation, continuous sort of building on that experimentation? Um, you know, there's a, actually a very specific question, you know, could have the evolution from grass to maize uh, been shortened, um, you know, from this sort of 300 to, you know, 1500 years, had there been more structured development? Um, and actually there's some comments there as well, but what are your thoughts in terms of how structured was the science of the Neolithic, if we are daring to call it science? Well, you see, in, just in terms of botany, again, going to Levi Strauss, he has numerous examples of hunter-gatherer people whose lives depend on knowing where the plants are, people having a huge amount of botanical knowledge. So whereas we would know, we would be able to name 20 or 30 plants, there are people who can name hundreds of plants. There are examples of uh, older peoples who live in, particularly arid areas like deserts, and they may know 60, 70, 80 plants. There is one um, people that he quotes who've a, bo a botanical vocabulary of something like 2000 terms. So these are people with such a huge and immense knowledge of plants. The, the mystery is in terms of breeding, why they didn't start plant breeding, why they left it to nature and why only in the Neolithic they actually took it into their own hands. Indeed, and and I mean, with these eras, is of course you know they're perhaps less well defined um, than we assume they are because of course this is a backward projection, really how we assume. But um, I suppose one question to sort of wrap up this discussion of Neolithic is is perhaps a question as to um, you know did the did effectively um, the the work and the development of the Neolithic set of thinking right, which you've so beautifully outlined, this sort of time-based thinking, perhaps effectively seized because of the Bronze End collapse around, you know, 1000 BC, related to various volcanic activity. I mean, is it, was it really just disrupted in a sense, and then the new came along with the with the post volcan well, the post Bronze Age development, Bronze Age development. Ah, uh, yes, this is interesting because indeed, the various suggestions that the 
what I think is was, was indeed a golden age of the Neolithic. Something happened and it could have been a, a, a catastrophe. Certainly the, the, tr the people who analyze the tree rings have got various periods. I, I think just from memory, there's one about 2300 BC, this is very approximate, one about 1600 BC, one about 1150 BC. And whatever the reason for those catastrophic periods could have been the, the eruption, for example, of, a, of a, a big volcano, could have been the earth passing through the, the tail of a, a, a comet, whatever the um, cause of that, it certainly had a catastrophic effect on civilizations. And the interesting question then is, after that, we know, of course, that survivors carried and built up again, but did they feel that it was important to keep somehow this balance and this harmony between earth and sky? I think you've lost your microphone, Matthias. Mat Mat <laughs> I have. I clicked on it three times to bring myself back up again, but every single time I clicked on it, it disappears again for some reason. Anyways, um, thank you so much, Harry. This was extremely insightful. And as, as I said, I think there'll be more um, discussion about it, um, perhaps later tonight in the uh, Festival Club. Um, so thank you, Harry. Thank you also, uh, Barry, for joining us on behalf of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and help us pay this special tribute uh, to the work of Dr. Uh, Euron Mackay. Um, thank you also to the technical team for looking after all of us uh, so well. And thank you for everyone at home uh, for joining us uh, today for this exciting talk. Uh, we have two more journeys into the past this afternoon. Uh, at two o'clock, we go to Finland uh, to hear about one of the great names in the field of paleontology there, a man who built up a vivid picture of the great um, Ice Age mammals, such as cave bear um, and saber-toothed uh, tiger. And then at half past three, we go to Greenland uh, to look at two ancient signs and the meaning of Norse and Inuit uh, people. Uh, so um, there's a lot of interesting stuff. There's, of course, the lunchtime uh, session uh, that's starting uh, in just a few minutes, but we've taken perhaps a bit longer, uh, but of course, a fascinating talk uh, by Howie. Uh, so please, um, all of you watching us at home, uh, do make sure that you subscribe to our uh, social media channels. Um, and uh, from all of us here, uh, do join us for more exciting science festival events. And as I've already mentioned, please do join us at half past nine in the evening for the festival club. But for now, this is goodbye from us and hope you enjoy your, the rest of your afternoon.